on my podcast. This is where you come to start and grow your B2B tech sales career. And I bring on the best in B2B tech sales and B2B sales in general, like Jason Bay, who's our guest today. Jason has trained SDRs and account executives at top companies like Monday.com, Zoom, um, Gong, and so many others to help them understand how to stop leaning on a big brand name or a good economy to get meetings and turn strangers into paying customers. In this conversation, we're going to dig into how to outbound effectively and how to sell and close deals. So if you're an SDR and AE out there trying to take your game to the next level, you're going to want to stay for the whole conversation. Jason, thanks so much for being here. How's your day going so far? Yeah, looking forward to it, man. I uh, Day's going good. I, I just started doing jujitsu, which, which is something that you're going to talk about a lot if you start. So I have that like right after this. <laughs> Okay. Um, oh. hey, by the way, time check. I feel like I do this with top executives <laughs> and thought leaders like yourself. Do we have the full hour? Oh, we have the full hour. Yes. Hopefully this will burn off some of the nerves because it's like my fourth class, you know, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. And you know what? It's fun. Um, so how let, let's go in, in this direction unexpectedly. How did you get into jujitsu? Cause I feel like people like you, that are yeah. top performers, speakers doing amazing things or just well-rounded folks trying mm -hmm. new things. So how did you get into this? Yeah. So last, I want to say probably May of last year, um, business is doing really well. Like I remember we're working with some big clients and I had all of a sudden like some really bad anxiety, like felt like really low energy for an entire week. I had to cancel like client calls and all this kind of stuff. And what that made me realize in that moment was, Hey dude, I got to take care of myself better, like physically. and talking to my doctor, therapist, that sort of stuff, what they recommended to anyone that deals with any kind of anxiety is you know, some sort of hard cardio that you do on a semi-regular basis. So that got me into more into fitness. So I started doing like Orange Theory and stuff like that and just like getting like a sweat, you know? And the way that I got into jujitsu now is that, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to understand how to like, self-defense like that sort of stuff but then also do something that's practical and fun and has some good camaraderie outside of what you do for work and that's what you get at any kind of gym that you go to and i found that stuff like that whether it be jujitsu uh, i snowboard with my wife as well so snowboarding season hopefully the mountain will our couple <laughs> um, awesome. doing stuff like that outside of your work that will completely take your mind off of work I find is the best way to like reduce anxiety and to really just take care of your mental health. Man, I am so glad you shared that. And thank you for your vulnerability. I think just being a human being, we've all dealt with anxiety. I even felt nervous before we hopped on live and I was trying to like yeah. uh, deal with the nerves. This happens <laughs> and it's just a part of life. Totally. And I definitely agree that physical exercise is such a great way to just put ourselves at ease and get out of the, um, our head and into our physical um, mm -hmm. body. So what a great yeah. note to you know start on. And I wanted to continue the momentum by talking about how you got into sales and why do you love this career path? So my first sales job was going door to door selling house painting services. Was, that's what I did as a freshman in college. So that was 2007, 2008. Someone, uh, a guy named Barry, he, he became one of my really good friends and sales manager. He just came into my classroom and talked about this internship thing where you can run a business. And I just signed up, honestly, Chris, because it's like this. They said you could make $10,000 over the summer. <laughs> That's a good thought, amount of money. Like, yes, yeah. especially when you're in college, right? Like, oh, yeah, dude, because I stacked wood on a cart at a mill for 60 hours a week prior uh, the summer prior to that. So I was like, I'll do anything you know, to make more money than that. So what I didn't understand about that job was, oh, it's not like painting. You're going to be running the business. And part of that is marketing, which means going door to door. So I had to learn how to go door to door. And I'm this really shy kid in high school. I still had braces, you know, at this time. And I come from a small town in Brookings, Oregon, 5,000, 6,000 people. So the thought of going door to door was just totally frightening to me. And what Barry showed me was how to do that in a way where you don't put your self-esteem into like external things that are out of your control. And what I mean by that is how not to let someone else having a bad day that might slam a door in your face, because that happened a lot, <laughs> or people that were eating dinner, 
how not to let that rattle you. And honestly, that meant so much more to me is seeing him get a door slammed in the space or someone being really rude to him and him just totally shrugging it off like it wasn't that big of a deal compared to him, you know, booking an appointment and an estimate, you know, and I just really, I was like, oh, wow, this is awesome. You know, I'm working something that's results based. So I did really well. I ended up making almost $30,000 that summer. Uh, sold Three times what was expected. Yeah. So sold $100,000 plus of uh, painting services, wow. hired like a painting crew. And then I came back as a sales manager and they did that for multiple years. But that got me really interested in sales. I never even honestly knew what sales was prior to that. I thought sales was, you know, people that sell insurance and stuff like that. I didn't realize that sales like really permeates into every aspect of life. You know what I mean? And then as a sales manager, that's where I really picked up. And that was the part that was harder for me. I didn't, I didn't do as well right away with that was like teaching other people how to do sales and coaching other people. So that kind of brought me full circle to what I do now, obviously under a B2B context, but that's really where I grew the love for, for selling, for helping sellers, for teaching people that have very little sales experience. That's sort of our sweet spot. And what we do now is working with young SDRs, account executives with mm. three to five years of experience where they don't have a ton of business acumen yet. And there's a lot they still need to learn, but it's really about learning the basics and the fundamentals. So that's, that's how I got started, man. You're such a perfect guest for this channel because we've got a lot of folks <laughs> that are live right now and that we'll see this in the future that are looking to break into tech sales or they're yeah. early on in their journey and they want to ride this wave to create a life of freedom and impact. And, you know, I'm projecting mm -hmm. my own vision for what tech sales is about, but yeah. you're such a perfect guest. And so I wanted to double click into one thing you mentioned, basically detaching your self-esteem from outcomes is what I yeah. heard you say. And correct me if I'm wrong on that phraseology, yeah. but can you speak mm. to how we can get to that point? Sure. It's really hard. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. So the thing that I was taught in therapy, which I'm a, happy to be a very big proponent of, uh, my therapist at the time, Sam, taught me this thing called the CBT triangle, the cognitive behavioral therapy triangle. And it was essentially, if you look, imagine a triangle on the top of that triangle, you imagine your behavior. So that's the actions that you take, whether you decide to do something, what you say, et cetera. There's your thoughts on one of the triangle, and then there are your emotions and feelings. And looking at those as three separate things. So in other words, our thoughts and our feelings they don't have to, you know, drive our, uh, sorry, our emotions don't have to drive our thoughts. Our thoughts don't have to necessarily drive our actions. You could look at those things independently of each other. So to make this really practical with sales, um, when someone slams a door in your face or you make a cold call in tech sales, right? What you might be feeling physically in that moment, the emotion you might be experiencing is what you shared you were experiencing right before this. And I experienced the same thing before when I'm interviewing someone, if that makes you feel better, where yeah, it's interesting. anxiety and, and nerves, right? Maybe even a little bit of fear, depending on who it is. Um, how you think about that, the thoughts associated with that feeling, you can tell yourself a lot of different stories, right? You can tell yourself, oh God, I'm about to interview Chris and he's a really big deal and God, I might mess it up and that's going to be really embarrassing. Or it's, hey, Chris sounds like a really interesting person. I'm super excited to get to know him, right? It's the same with cold calling. It's you can go into that thinking, oh God, it's going to go really bad. They're going to be really irritated that I called them. Or you can look at it like I'm going to make their day. And that will drive your behavior one way or the other to make the call or not make the call. So I think looking at the relationship between your thoughts, your emotions, and then your behavior, those are interdependent things. The more you can practice this and notice that, the more likely you are to be able to deal with call reluctance or nerves or anxiety. And the last piece of advice I would have is, yeah, you know, I was speaking at an SKO earlier this year. <laughs> There's 500 people there, dude. That's the biggest live audience. Like in that person. is a good size audience. Yeah. Big audience. And I remember they were kind of introducing me and I'm just standing up at the front, looking over at the audience. My heart is just like, I can just feel my heart beating in my chest, you know? 
And what I always remind myself in those moments is that every single person that gets up on this stage is feeling something very similar. Like that's a very normal feeling. And then that's that's my feelings, right? And then the thought that I'm reminding myself of is I'm validating essentially how I feel and normalizing it and psyching myself up a bit, right? So that would be my other piece of advice is to really, whatever you're feeling, try not to change how you feel. It's very hard to control that. What you do have a lot more control over is your behavior and how you think and your thoughts. So easier said than done though, but that's that's sort of the foundation. So if you're approaching a high performance moment, like a cold call, something that's scary where you could get rejected yeah. or when you're giving a speech in front of a 500 person audience where you could embarrass yourself and fail. Yeah. One thing you're saying is to accept the nerves. Yeah. And they dissipate a bit knowing they're natural and it's okay. Mm -hmm. You alluded to coming from a place of service as well. Like how can I serve this customer? Also like, yeah. I'm curious to get to know Chris um, mm -hmm. what's he like. Are there any other places from which you can come to like empower yourself with a good story that, um, cause that, that in and of itself is like gold, but are there any other ways that you empower yourself mentally in these situations? Yeah. I think one of the first things to talk about is what you can do physically, like the behavior that you can take. That's probably the easiest one. Cause it's, it's literally as simple as for a lot of people, instead of sitting down, when you make cold calls, stand up. I happen to be a pacer too. So if I'm on the phone, I'm too. pacing back and forth because I just get into like a little rhythm that way. Right. Um, another thing too, would be doing something active prior to your cold calling block. And that could just be walking around your block, like get your heart rate up and get like your energy level up. Those are very, very simple things to do in terms of like the mental stuff. Um, I already shared one, like the, the judo that you can play in your head yeah, and talking to yourself that, that is really hard to do. I think, I think the more simple thing to do is a couple things. Um, I'm a big fan of UFC and, you know, John Jones, he's a uh, fighting at heavyweight right now, but it was a big deal. He was about to move from 205 pounds to 265 and he was going to fight this guy, Francis Ngannou, who's like a yeah. human size. Yep. And in the interview, what really stuck out to me is they asked him, are you afraid of this guy? And he said, you know what? I, I kind of am actually, but I've come to grips with the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is that I go in there and I get knocked out. Or maybe he breaks my jaw and I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm wow. at peace with that being an outcome. And if you think about all of the things you do in sales, the consequences of failure are not that high. Yeah. They're <laughs> they not really that are. bad. I don't know if I'd be okay with a broken jaw. Like <laughs> you're not going to get punched in the face probably. Yeah. Um, at least through the phone uh, yeah, for sure. You can't, it's impossible. Um, so what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is if someone hangs up on you, they get a little angry, whatever. It, and it happens way less often. Than you would think you know um so i think that's one thing the other thing is to change your goal so to get really practical with cold calling the objective with a cold call when you pick up the phone and dial is not to book a meeting like that's not your objective your objective is to have genuine conversation i don't even know if i want to meet with you chris if you pick up the phone you may not even be in a situation where it even makes sense for us to yeah. to chat and to connect further so my objective is how can I just break through this like buyer? Uh, the thing that buyers do is they run away and ignore salespeople. The thing that salespeople do is, you know, they're really persistent and bug people and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of like what we're known for. That's the, the dynamic yeah. between the two, right? The way that you can break through that dynamic is like just being really human on the call and having genuine conversation, asking for permission, you know, hey, Chris. I know I probably got you in the middle of something. Do you got a minute for me to share the reason for my call? You can let me know if you want to keep talking. Cool. And then mm -hmm. instead of pitching Chris here, I'm going to say, Chris, I speak with a lot of your peers like X, Y, and Z. And here's what they're working on right now. How does that align with what you're working on? And I can give some really practical examples if you want. But changing the goal. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to book a meeting right away. Like really my objective is to break through that buyer-seller dance, I've heard it called where I can just have genuine conversation. Same with objection handling. My goal is not to handle the objection. It's to just get an authentic response that's not send me an email or I'm about to hop into a meeting at 4.17 yeah. p.m. You know what I mean? So changing the goal can really 
be a, uh, and this comes from sports, it's focusing on the technique and the thing that's right in front of you versus winning the game. You know, I played basketball in high school. I didn't think about winning the game the entire time. I thought about this play. What do I need to do right now? What's the next best thing to do? So there's a couple of techniques that sort of come to mind if you're using that CBT triangle as a framework, things that you can do that are pretty easy to deal with any kind of anxiety or reluctance that you might have. That is so powerful because I think our full potential is on the other side of risk and uncertainty. And if we could learn to yeah. swim in that and lean into it and just take action, mm -hmm. then we can just open up a whole new world of possibility in business and even in our personal life. And so you're yeah. sharing ways we can empower ourselves to have the courage to step into that unknown and take action. And it, don't you think you don't have to be perfect, right? Like if you, I called, cold called you and I, I use your permission based opener, which was awesome. And I, and maybe I like, I wasn't like, didn't deliver it perfectly, but I sh like came from a place of authenticity and that was clear. Do you think like some customers would, I mean, you, you don't have to be perfect to set a meeting, right? And they tell, correct me if I'm wrong, but I no, like you really don't. That. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to be perfect in sales either. I think that there's this, uh, so one thing that I did for a little while was stand-up comedy, and uh, I wasn't definitely, obviously not good enough to make it a career. <laughs> but one of the things you learn is there's a couple of processes that you have to go through in order to come up with a decent joke. One is you have to go to open mics and you have to drill the joke, like practice the joke for the first time in front of a live audience to see if it's going to work or not. You just have to accept that most of what you tell during that open mic is not going to be funny. And it's like how you react to that is super important. So if you can laugh off and not make such a big deal out of messing up, other people don't get nervous for you. It's kind of like watching a movie with really bad acting and you're like, you can't, you're like nervous because yeah. it's like so bad and awkward. You create that feeling by making a big deal out of it. The other thing that I learned in stand-up comedy too is, dude, the audience doesn't know what the joke is. You're the one that wrote it. Much yeah. like the prospect, they don't know what you're supposed to say, dude. <laughs> They don't know what's on your script. They don't know your value prop. Yeah. So don't make a bigger deal out of something than it really is. And so with the, most go ahead. people go ahead. have quite a bit of compassion, I find. When you're trying and you don't make a big deal out of stuff and you're confident, most people are like roll with the punches. Absolutely. And so I wanted to double click into this uh, cold call approach that you have. Sure. So you're big on the permission based opener. Could you share that again? And I don't know if you have yeah. one tried and true way to do that or different variations, but would love to double click into the opener. Yeah, I got a bunch of them. Actually, I'll kind of open a document as I'm, as I'm talking through this. So I think with cold calling, the most important thing, again, is to understand the objective is authentic conversation. OK, so the first thing that we need to do is in order to have authentic conversation, we need to know like what bad looks like and sounds like. <laughs> Yep. So if we reverse engineer and think about from the prospect's point of view, when they pick up the phone, what are the bad experiences that they have? So I really believe that, and you let me know if you feel differently, no one picks up a cold call on purpose. They don't pick up the call thinking it's a salesperson and they're like eager to hear your pitch. They thought that you were someone else, maybe a client, maybe their kid's school. Would you agree? Yeah. A hundred percent agree. And sometimes I feel like now some of these uh, spammers or, I mean, they're actual people. They're using my home area code 239 from Naples, Florida. And sometimes it tricks me or like, oh, yeah. yeah, totally. I'd never intentionally pick it up. I, I'm honest, even me, I'm not an executive, but I'm busy executing on my priorities. So, yeah. 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 So people don't pick up the cold call on purpose. So a philosophy, if we break down the call, into intro, hook, and close, where our goal in the intro, about 80% of the time, the cold call fails in the first 60 seconds. So our goal in that first 60 seconds is just to buy more time. If we can do that, we're doing better than 80, 90% of reps. That hook area, that's where we're gonna wanna engage the prospect with a few questions, and we wanna like really find a reason to meet. And then the close, that's where we wanna secure time and ask for the meeting and that kind of stuff. So for your intro, um, I'm a big fan of a permission-based intro. You don't have to use one though. I like am a, too, by the way. I definitely yeah, just, I, I think it's a way to do it. The psychology here is that if I'm cold calling Chris, by definition, he did not ask me to call him. So I'm going to get him to opt in. 
and there's a bunch of different variations of this. I'll rattle off a few, but I think one of the worst ways to open your call is, you know, hey, Chris, it's Jason with Outbound Squad. I was calling about sales training at XYZ Company. You got a minute? And it's like, I'm talking about the solution and the like right at the top, I'm like already like preparing this prospect for a pitch. We don't want to do that. Okay. So if you're asking, I wanted to inquire if sales training is top of your mind. I want to see if you're interested in our sales training. Don't do any of that kind of stuff. Okay. So I'll give you kind of the basic formula. It's yeah. some sort of acknowledgement or empathy, and then a specific request for time. So I'll give you a, a couple different variations yeah. that I've used and I've heard reps use. So once the classic, I call it, it's, hey, Chris, it's Jason with Outbound Squad. I know I probably got you in the middle of something. Do you got a minute for me to share the reason for my call? The one that I, when I was working with Gong, that they sort of popularized that I really liked, and I listened to them do tons of calls with sales executives, your tonality is super important with this. Uh, hey, Chris, it's Jason with Outbound Squad. I don't suppose I got you at the worst possible time, did I? And you got to kind of chuckle, smile, like your tonality and pace is so important. I loved your tone because I nerd out on these things and it was just so well delivered. You know, oh, it sounded good. very authentic and yeah, the tone is, is everything. Uh, tone is, it's like 80% of the game. It is... In the opener, I think people stress out about the best opener. Really, it's like, dude, do you sound confident and like you've done this a million times or not? That's really big. So the uh, the advice that I would give on tonality is to be friendly and you want to be incredibly hard to be an asshole too, is my advice, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Put a big old smile on your face. Make it really hard to be rude to you. Uh, and then no up talk or customer service voice. So you're not talking to your insurance agent. You're not doing things like, hey, Chris, it's Jason with Outbound Squad. How's your day going? I don't know why, but when in customer service roles and sales, we tend to put on this fake voice that we yeah. don't normally use. Did I catch you at a bad time? Like Did I catch you at a bad time? Yeah, it's it's really weird. Um, the the other one, the third one that I would share with you, and this is a favorite of mine and of a lot of the reps that I work with too, is you're going to pack the front of your line, your opening line, with something relevant to the prospect. So I'm working with a client right now that sells a software that helps these large like solar companies like invest in new properties and, and projects. So one of the things that they run into is they have a new project coming up and it just takes a really long time for them to work with consultants and all this other stuff to just do what's called due diligence on the land. So when they call to say, uh, hey, Chris, was just giving you a call about the solar project you guys just launched in Austin. Oh, by the way, it's Jason with Outbound Squad. You got mm. a minute? So you're opening up with something that's like going to perk the prospects here. So there's this book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Yes. And the concept. So you've read it. There's system one and system two thinking. So our brain essentially operates in these two modes. System one is this very, um, it's instinctive. It's when I'm driving a car and someone swerves out in the middle of the road, I don't even think about how to respond. I just automatically swerve out of the way. The equivalent in sales is when you walk into a mall and I see a salesperson approaching me out of the corner of my eye. And I don't know about you. I don't, I, I look away. Usually I try not to. I do. Eye contact. I, it I doesn't even matter. Often on the street, yeah. like not even a salesperson, but they're talking about a certain cause, which maybe is a good cause, but yeah, let's be real. It's just, you know, you don't even think twice about it, right? It's instinctive. Yeah. System two is calculated. That's the mode that you and I are in right now. We're thinking about what we're seeing. We're very intentional. We want to break the prospect out of system one. So when they're giving you objections, like not interested, not right now, send me an email. Who is this? Who are you calling from? In the first 15, 20 seconds, that's just a habitual response. That's an instinctive response. So by doing some of these things and getting their attention, we're breaking them out of system one and getting them into system two, where they were just on their phone, they're writing email, whatever that they were doing, we want to get them their thinking. So I'll go ahead and pause there. That's that's a part of the intro. The first part is that permission-based opener. This is gold. And that was so well put, breaking them out of system one, this subconscious automatic system to uh, engage in a conscious co conversation with system two. And that's a great book, by the way, like you said, to check out. Yep. Um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman. Didn't he win like a Nobel Prize or something? Yeah, very famous psychologist or behavioral scientist, one or the other. 
uh, someone that's much smarter than me. <laughs> I love that, that studies this stuff and all that kind of thing. I love that you bring psychology into your work. And that's actually one of the things I love about sales in general is it sparked mm -hmm. a passion for psychology in myself. Oh, yeah. And maybe you'd agree. So, yeah, definitely. It's uh, human behavior is uh, very interesting. You know, I think it's Dan Arley, is how you pronounce his name, wrote a book called uh, Predictably Irrational. You know, and it's just like how people will do irrational things, but in a very predictable manner. <laughs> and the thing that I love about cold calling is that you can predict with pretty high certainty how that call is going to go. You're either going to get someone that's very friendly and engages with you or you're not. And if they give you an objection, it's going to be some sort of brush off, like not interested, not right now. Send me an email. Or you're going to get into a conversation with someone that kind of says, we already have a, a solution for this, or you know, we don't really have budget right now. It's pretty predictable what's going to happen during the call. It's what I love about sales is you're dealing with a human. So there is that element and that variable. But when once you've done this enough times, you can practice and rehearse just like you can for sports. That's the coolest part to me. So Jason, you use a great permission based opener with me, but I'm still like, Hey, sorry, I'm running to a meeting. I gotta go. How would you handle that objection? So you haven't even gotten to framing the value. Yeah. Yet. yeah so if someone says I have a meeting and I gotta go, the, the framework behind objection handling. And again, our objective with objections is we don't want to handle the objection right away. We just want the prospect to be able to listen to us and have genuine, authentic dialogue with them. So I actually want to greet the objection. I want to do the opposite. I'm just going to greet or acknowledge the objection they just gave me. And then I'm going to go and, and offer an alternative, essentially. So if someone says, I'm about to hop into a meeting, you could say, oh, hey, totally fine. Or, hey, got it. Or sounds like I caught you in the middle. Any acknowledgement of yeah. that is, there's no perfect answer to that. And if it's, I'm about to hop into a meeting, it's, well, hey, they didn't say they didn't want to talk right now. Let's just say, Oh, hey, no problem, Chris. Uh, I'll make this quick. I was giving you a call because I speak with a lot of HR leaders. And one thing they keep telling me right now is they're using three, four, five different systems for payroll benefits, et cetera. And it just creates a lot of admin work for their team. And they're looking to get some of that admin work off their team's plate. Is that by chance something that you're thinking about and, and focused on right now? Or am I totally barking up the wrong tree? Love it. I love that. So, that is so good. And so you answered my next question, which is, how do you frame uh, the reason why you're calling and hook someone to get them curious and to open yeah. up a dialogue? And so quick mm -hmm. thing is, is that how roughly how you would frame value and open up the core part of the call if they did say, yes, go ahead? Or yeah. is, is that roughly what it would look like? Yep. So the number one mistake people make at the beginning of the call is they talk about their solution. And even if you sell Zoom, let's say, I worked with Zoom for quite a bit. If you sell Zoom, people know who Zoom is, but dude, they don't really know the product suite of Zoom. Zoom is so much more than just a video communication tool now. They have so much there. Yeah. So when you talk about your solution, you're basically assuming that the prospect knows all the problems that it solves and how it would fit into their world and all this other stuff. And what we're essentially asking a complete stranger to do, Chris, is to come into our world and check out how cool our stuff is. That's a big ask of a stranger. Sales, especially prospecting, is all about getting in their world. You add context to your solution by talking in a universal language that buyer and seller understand, and that's priorities and problems. So I want to open up with what I call a reverse pitch. So when I do the permission-based opener, you got a minute for me to show the reason for my call. Chris says, yes. I'm going to talk about what I do, but through the lens of a customer. So I'll give you another example. I work with a customer that sells into contact center leaders. So I might say, Chris, I was giving you a call. I noticed you head up the contact centers at ABC Company. I'm talking to a lot of contact center leaders right now, and their number one priority is reducing cost to serve. So they have way too many people calling into the contact center when really they want them to self-serve through FAQs, et cetera. And the other focus that we're hearing right now is really on the employee experience. So churn is pretty high in the contact center. And how do we increase employee retention and, and provide better training? Does any of that relate with you at all? Or are you working on something totally different? So I'm like really specific with 
the types of personas that I reach out to, call center leader, HR person, CISO, whatever it is, dude, there's a pattern in what these people care about. There's totally a pattern between those people. I want to speak to common priorities and goals that they have, and I'm looking for alignment at the top. I don't want to say we have this solution or you're interested in hearing about it. I'm, I want to say, hey, we work with a lot of people like you and they care about these things. Do you also care about those things? Now we're on the same page. Number one rule in sales is don't pitch until you know what they care about. So I'm not going to talk about my solution until I understand what they care about, but I'm kind of talking about it at the same time. It's called customer voice. So you're using customer voice instead of product voice. You're shifting from, hey, look how great we are. We do this to, I get your world. I talk to other people like you and they're facing these challenges. How are you handling that? Or are you dealing with these challenges yourself? And I, as the prospect, as I heard you um, give a reverse pitch to me, if I was the contact person, person, I'd be like, man, Jason actually gets my world. I think he might be able to help me. Taking a meeting with him will actually be worth my time. Yeah. Skepticism is your number one enemy that you have to like combat in any kind of selling, but especially cold prospecting. So sales is one of those careers. I think besides maybe lawyers, it's probably one of the few jobs where every, almost everyone you interact with is skeptical of you, including your customers. Through your uh, demonstration of empathy, you definitely build a lot of trust. And I'm curious When a new SDR is starting out at Snowflake or Gong or whatever company Mm -hmm. they uh, break into when they get into tech sales, what should they focus on to ramp up their time to effectiveness um, as quickly as possible? And I am going to throw in, like, based on what you're saying, I feel like they should become an expert in the customer's world and, and, and know who their key personas are and the ideal customer profile and make sure they're reaching out to the right targets. Am I on the right, you know, track here? Where should someone focus to ramp up quickly? So I'll do, I'll give you snowboarding as an an analogy. Okay. Do you snowboard or ski? I've gone a few times. I'm a Florida man, you know, so I didn't even, I didn't even discover, you know, that funny (laughs) website. That's how I introduced tongue in cheek, introduced (laughs) myself, but I didn't discover um, snow until I was a bit older, but I did um, go to Georgetown university in DC. And then I cut my teeth in sales um, at Oracle in Boston. So DC and Boston, I did actually, yeah. I went from Florida to the Northeast and crazy, like cold. There we go. Now I'm in Austin. So yeah. Um, but I've gone a few times. Yeah. So if you think about the very first time that you go or the very first time, let's use something a little more universal. The first time you learned how to drive, everyone probably remembers that. And for some of your audience, it's a little younger. It was not too long ago, right? Yeah. The first time that your mom or dad or whoever sat in the car with you and taught you how to drive, they didn't start really high level with like all of the, or maybe they never even did this. They didn't start with like the physics behind the car and like what you're doing. They said, Hey dude, here's the brake and here's the gas. When you see a red light, you better hit the brake. You see the speed limit. You want to drive the speed limit. They didn't really talk about technique and like all of the other physics behind it. It was just like, do this or do that. And when you're first learning something, you kind of need to, like, if you're an SDR listening to this and it's your first job, You kind of just need to start doing it. Like learning about the personas. Yeah, that's really important. But you know what's a way faster hack is who's the best SDR on the team and just copy them. Mm. Just do exactly what they do until you can make it your own. I think the thing in sales that people, like they try to reinvent the wheel too much. My advice would be the same if you're a seasoned account executive and you go to a new company. Dude, just do what the most successful people do. The blueprint's yeah, already there. Don't try to make it your own yet. Uh, with me, biz- running a business, people already run coaching and training businesses and sell courses and programs and do what I do. Follow the blueprint. Yes. Now, once you know what the blueprint is and you know a lot of the what, then you can kind of step back and think about the why. And that's where, yes, you need to engross yourself, if that's the right word, into the people you're speaking with, you've probably never done their job before. So you need to learn as much as you can about it. The best way though, is if your company records those sales calls, is that your dog? (laughs) Uh, Look at her. Oh, Oh. Bella, she does this, man. (laughs) I had to mute myself a few times because she's just rambunctious, but Bella, you want to say something? Anyways, keep going. No, this is gold. Keep going. Um, 
So <laughs> um, your best resource is call recordings. If you're an SDR, listen to the best account executives at your company, follow their deals and gong or chorus or whatever you use, follow their deals and just listen to the language that they use and the prospects use when they're selling. That's going to give you a lot of really good stuff to use when you're prospecting. That's number one. Uh, number two is I'm going to look for the type of content that my prospects consume, the podcasts they might listen to, the conferences that they go to, the blogs, the articles, the trade associations, whatever it is, I'm going to consume the same content that they consume. Another hack too, if you're at a company that maybe doesn't have great case studies or testimonials is look at the top competitor in your category. Yeah. They probably have really good content. And then lastly, another thing, depending on the persona is job postings. So you can look for job postings for that specific role that you reach out to in the job postings. You'd be surprised. Like the job descriptions are very like, you know, specific about the outcomes and responsibilities yep. and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then there's, I'm not the biggest fan of it yet. I think it's getting better, but there's always chat GPT too. Yeah. Right. So you can get in there and it's not going to do stuff for you, but if you give it specific prompts and enough guidance, it can probably tease out some, some content and stuff for you. But that's where I would start. The number one resource you have is sitting on your sales team, unless you're like a new hire at a really small company where no one's figured anything out yet. We just got the blueprint to success. If you're an FDR <laughs> at a new company, yeah. or if you're an AE starting out at a yep. new company in any type of sales role, and I love what you said. I resonated with every aspect and you even got me thinking about things that I wasn't thinking about. And you validated things that I've done in the past. Like when I was at Google Cloud, our number one competitor in the market leader is AWS. And I actually went to their website to see how they frame the value. I'm like, they're doing a darn good job. Yeah. And then also, you know, Google has BigQuery data, data analytics solution. I can look at Snowflake. They've done really well in the data warehousing space. So to your point, um, you can kind of, the best art is steel. And also, you know, you can just, you know, replicate a system that's working for a top for performer. I was cursed in a way because my mom is a professional portrait painter and musician and she's artistic and I feel like I need yeah. to bring creativity to sales, but which you can, but it's actually just keep it simple and replicate from someone like you, Jason, who has executed and been successful, learn from a top performer and just repeat and, and do. Yeah. Just follow the system. You know, I think that's one of the like if I could go back and give myself advice as I was really learning sales back in the day, it would be to try to adopt my own style sooner Um, because I spent too much time. So you can go too far with that, too. You can copy yeah. too much. I think that the goal is if there are other people hitting quota, do exactly what they do until you're hitting quota. And then you can start embellishing and trying stuff and doing all this other stuff. You've earned some street cred, you know, at that point. Yeah, that's a good point. You can replicate what someone's doing and then add your own special sauce over time. And I feel like that is an yep. evolution of a seller. And I've experienced that in my yep. own career. Um, you know, thanks to the folks who've showed up live. We got a good audience here. You draw a, a crowd, Jason. It's pretty awesome. And uh, Optimus Yaim, we've got some funny names here, asked a question. Or he, he's, I think he said <laughs> a new SDR here. Um, yeah. Having trouble uncovering pain points. That's pretty high level, yeah. Jason. But do you have any thoughts? I think they're referring to like in a cold call, like mm -hmm. and any and this is really discovery. So what what yeah. are some of the tips on this front? Yeah. So if you've been following along so far, we've talked about the intro hook and then close part of the cold yeah. call. So this would be the hook. I think the number one like bad piece of advice that I see, and I think it's coming from a good place on LinkedIn around cold calling, is to find problems, to ask about them. And there's definitely some merit to that. But if I'm speaking with you, Chris, a complete stranger, and I get you on the phone, how likely are you to open up with all of the problems going on in your business at that time? You're just not to a complete stranger. I need to buy goodwill first. So the, the way that we start with the priority drop, that's going to be my first advice for you is make yeah. sure that you're aligned with the priorities. Once someone says, yeah, you know, Reducing cost to serve right now is a really big focus. Now I can start asking you about problems. But you know what I don't want to do? I don't want you to admit that you have a personal problem. To me, I'm going to share problems that we hear that your peers have. And I'm just going to see if that resonates with yeah. you. It's easier for me to agree to a problem that all my peers have than to be 
like, yeah, this is not going well right now. Oh, yeah. wait, wait, it's not going well for other coaches right now because of the, or whatever, you know, that's easier for yeah. me to agree with. It would still be hard to agree with <laughs> yeah. because of my pride, but that's <laughs> going to sound something like this. The, the framework is called question stacking. Okay. So I'm going to stack context in front of my questions. So if we're using the contact center uh, as an example, I'm not going to say, Chris, well, what's been the biggest challenge that you've had in getting customers to self-serve? Now you're going to be like, where do I start? There's just like, there's so many places to go with that question. Yeah. And it's really high effort. It's high friction to answer. It's a lot of effort. Yeah. I want to reduce is. the amount of effort to respond. So I'm going to give an example. I'm going to say, you know, Chris, one of the things that we hear from a lot of customers is that they rework those FAQ pages a bunch and a bunch and a bunch. And it ends up actually frustrating the customer more because they can't find what they're looking for and they just call into the contact center anyways. I'm really curious, how do you identify specific reasons that people try to FAQ and can't find the answer and end up calling in anyways? How do you find those reasons to diagnose them? Now we're like getting really in the weeds with a very specific question that's like easier to answer. And I'm also demonstrating expertise like a consultant in this case by talking about problems that other people have. So that's my advice is you should know when you're reaching out to people, what problems does your solution solve for and what priorities do those align with? And I'm just going to say, I talk to a lot of people like you that share this problem how do you deal with that? That's that's the basic framework. You're going to find that a lot of people are more open to answering that. I'll give you one more tip. The other tip is to don't be assumptive that they actually have the problem. So I can use wording like this and say, Chris, um, you've probably already figured this out, but I'm curious. When customers do try to self-serve on those FAQ pages and they can't find what they're looking for and they call into the contact center anyways, do you have a good way to identify like the reason? That they call in how, how would you find that and then giving you the benefit of the doubt so hey you're probably already on top of this or you know judging by your experience you've probably already talked about this you're probably already working out with your team but i wanted to ask you about xyz and people are just so much more willing to open up to you when you give them the benefit of the doubt and don't insult their intelligence Oh man, this is so good. And uh, I'm not going to lie. I was smiling as you shared these nuggets because one, it's brilliant. And two, I thought of a story from my Google yeah. cloud days, my first in-person meeting with the CEO in Bellevue, Washington and his ed technical person. And they're on Heroku, one of AWS, or uh, sorry, Salesforce's app dev platforms. It's really simple to start out as a business on Heroku, but as you grow and scale, you run into issues and Google cloud might actually be a fit. And I'd heard this is you know, a common challenge that uh, executives face. And I'm in the meeting and they're talking about the, you know, scalability issues with Heroku and pains. And I said towards the end, like, I'm really excited about your, t about your Heroku scalability problem. And the executive goes like, or like, it, like, I don't even know. Or like, he was just like, what the heck? Like, I'd love to talk more about that. And it's so it was framed so awkwardly and poorly, like, yeah. yay, you have a problem. So that means I have a better chance to sell you something. I think yeah. that's kind of what I subcommunicated. So <laughs> that's how not to do it. And we could apply it to yeah. a cold call scenario. When you hear it, like a, you uncover a legitimate pain point that you know you mm. can help with, how do we tie a nice bow on, on uh, locking in that next meeting in mm. a way that's um, tactful? Yeah, so I'm going to share a concept. It's called... Uh... Shift versus support. And this is from a uh, book called You're Not Listening, written by a woman named Kate Murphy. And this is assigned homework for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> the, uh, the general concept is that so, like, when that executive said that we had this problem, your gut is to shift the focus of the conversation onto yourself. That's what human nature is. It right? was so bad, so bad. Anytime we hear something that's remotely related to us, we think about how it relates to us. We do this every single day. I do it. Everyone's guilty of it. Okay. But we actually need to do... Oh, go ahead. I have to stop you. I did have an ex-girlfriend that actually told me all the time I was making things about me. And I was like, I'm trying to relate. <laughs> you, know, you know what? This is a personal issue, but... You, yeah, you this just, is like a therapy you session, dude. Me. I need to read this book anyways. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> I would just, she's got great interviews too. She's a very fun, fun interviewee. Yeah, yeah. Um, so 
shifting the focus onto yourself is not what you want to do in that moment. I want to support. I want to lean in. So when someone says, yeah, you know, we don't really have good analytics in place to be able to follow the user experience from the FAQ page into the contact center and like why they call. So instead of saying, oh, I'm so glad I called you. We can totally help you with that. I say, oh, tell me a little bit more about that. How's that affecting the cost to serve right now? What else have you guys tried? I want to get them talking a little bit more. So I love the framework, Ted. It's tell, explain, describe. I didn't come up with that. I don't know who came up with it. Hey, tell me a little bit more. So get them talking. So the hook is I know I'm ready to close and ask for the meeting when I have something that they've talked about. I have a problem that they've shared that our solution can help with. The way I'm going to transition and tie a bow to use your wording there is I'm yeah. simply just going to summarize what I heard. I find that people find this uh, transition to be a little awkward. I'm just going to say, Chris, thanks for sharing. So, so what I heard right now is that reducing cost to serve really big focus for you. If you don't really have a way to track reasons why people call into the contact center, and that's something that you really want to figure out, I'm really glad I called you because that's what we helped XYZ customer do. They were trying to drive down cost to serve, didn't know why people were calling in, and we helped them figure out some of those reasons so they could drive down the contact center volume. Um, can I make a quick suggestion? And usually you get an awkward response. They're like, yeah. Uh, that sure. Up. That's what yeah. I would say. Yeah. Um, how about we set aside some time when I'm not calling you randomly in the middle of the day? We can unpack this and I can share some of those insights with you. Do you have your calendar handy? I'm going to go straight into scheduling the meeting. Mm. That's how I transition. I'm just going to summarize in a sentence or two what I heard, share a quick customer story, two sentences, someone else that you've helped, and then I'm going to ask for time. I'm going to transition right into asking for time. You're smooth as silk. And I'm so glad we um, focused on cold calling because when I look at the data, even on what people search on on YouTube and what people care about in conversations I have, it is cold calling. It's one of the scariest mm -hmm. things and people really want to know how to do it effectively. So this was a clinic on cold calling today. Now we do have 13 minutes left and I'm going to squeeze as much out of you as I can for the audience's benefit. Yeah. Um, I My idea was to focus a little more on outbound and we haven't hit on cold emailing. I noticed that you can talk about all of it, though. You can talk about video, social selling, um, but I feel like cold emailing would be great to dig into a little bit, like some yeah. of the your principles to stand out in a, a sea of outreach. Dude, cold email is a tough game because uh, cold email, I think, is so much tougher than calling because we've been talking for most of our lives. We haven't been really writing like copy, like good copy for very long. Most people aren't taught how to really do that. You're taught in a very formal, like a very formal way in school, how to write. So it's just infinitely harder. Um, I think the biggest thing that you have going against you with cold email is that there, I mean, the average executive gets 150 to 200 emails a day. There's just so much more to compete with. They get so many fewer phone calls. Again, both are easy to ignore, but like email is very crowded. So with email, you have about 10 to 11 seconds that someone, if they if they even open the email, is actually going to read it. So what we need to step back and do with email is our big objective is the email needs to have a one-to-one -one look and feel. It can't have a one-to-many look and feel. So if you guys opened your inboxes right now, personal emails even, and looked at all the random emails that you got, you could tell without even opening them that they're from a stranger that's trying to sell you something. So we need to have a one-to-one -one look and feel. And it starts with, there's three things that we want people to do. We want them to first open the email. Then we want them to read the email. Then we want them to reply to the email. It doesn't sound like much, but that's kind of a lot of steps that we're asking someone to do. Okay? Yeah. So opening the email, it's all about the subject line and the first line of the, the email, the preview text, right? So subject line, the TLDR there is sales loft's got great data that shows that subject lines with four or five words or less have the highest open and reply rates. So your subject line, if all you did was reduce the length of the subject line to four to five words and didn't make it your company's name or your product name, that's a huge head start. I want to add relevance to that message by hopefully talking about something that's like relevant to you and your world. So if we're using the HR example, what I might put in the subject line is if I know the solutions that you're using, I might put those in the subject line. If I see that you're hiring, I might put the name of the job title. 
in the subject line, right? So that first line is the attention grabber. So our framework needs to be optimized for mobile. It needs to be short, catchy, all of that kind of stuff. And that starts with a four to five word subject line that starts with an attention grabbing statement at the front. So the reason why I'm reaching out and it cannot be about our stuff, it's gotta be about you. So if I'm reaching out about the contact center, I'm gonna talk about the FAQ page that I was just on. Um, I'm gonna talk about the wait time when I tried calling in. I'm gonna talk about initiatives that I see you talking about. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a good insight. It's it's all about them. And uh, I noticed you just made an act or uh, congratulations on the acquisition. Like I'm thinking uh, from my company's perspective, a cloud consulting firm, we handle migration work, consolidation work, um, mm -hmm. acknowledging a compelling event. Uh, congratulations on the new role or, and if you want to expand on this, feel free, but you're, you're at a high level, you're tailoring this to something unique to them. And is the tailoring yeah. more of like less about, oh, you have an adorable Corgi on your LinkedIn profile and less like personal like nuggets or flattery to the individual and more about business personalization? Like, is it, how do you think about that? I've noticed a trend that the more senior someone is, the more it needs to be related to the business and less personal. And the oh. reason for that is if you think about an executive, they're more closely tied to the business's outcomes. So if I'm reaching out to a CRO or a VP of sales versus a sales rep to get some intel or a sales manager, those are two totally like different approaches. They're going to follow the same framework, but in terms of what I call out, it's going to be different. Yeah, Des drop the word relevant into the chat, right? Relevance is really a big part of it. So I have that subject line. I have my attention grabber. That's the personalization. If you kind of built out a messaging matrix of your priorities, your prospects' priorities, their current solutions, the problems, their aspirations, there would be an additional column on the left there that shows like common triggers. So if someone is focused on reducing cost to serve, we know that they typically might be doing these things that I could find. They might be hiring in their contact center. They might have an FAQ page that is set up incorrectly. I'm going to look for the reasons to reach out. Um, the second part is I need a compelling like problem. So typically, it's going to be something like, uh, hey, hi, Chris was on your FAQ page and noticed that one of the first things you ask customers to do is call in at this number. Oftentimes when speaking with call center leaders, when they offer the number up this quickly, it actually drives up unnecessary call center volume, therefore reducing or uh, increasing the cost to serve. Therefore is a, probably a word I would have taken out of that email. So that's the problem statement. So I have compelling reason that I'm reaching out. I have the problem statement and then it's my value prop. The value well, prop is other people ahead. that we've helped. Go ahead. The value, just to repeat, the value prop is other people we've helped. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, yep. I just you piqued my curiosity. Why would you take therefore out? Oh, it just that's just not a word I would use. Too Personally, formal. I was talk. It feels too formal to me. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if I was talking to you, I want to emulate the conversational nature of how I would speak to you over the phone. That's a very good insight. On top of that, with business executives. It's less mm -hmm. about the personal stuff, fluff and more about being relevant from a business perspective. Also, that nugget right there is actually, uh, you know, very important. So continue on. Sorry to interrupt you, but just yep. curious. No, it's a great question. So the the value prop or social proof is what you're going to share next. So and so company used our help to solve this problem and accomplish X Y Z result, right? And then our CTA is next. The the data on CTAs is pretty clear. Gong analyzed hundreds of thousands of emails. And what they found is, you know, when you end an email with no question or an open-ended question, it has about a third of the reply rate as an interest-based question. So in other words, if I'm asking something like, Chris, is this worth exploring? Chris, interested in chatting more? Any of that type of stuff. Des is just dropping bombs in the chat, by the way. Talk to text is really good. So this is something I recommend, otter.ai. Record yourself talking through the email and just take the transcript and that's your draft right there. And just wow. edit it out. It's the best hack, dude, ever. I'm surprised it's not built into Outreach and Sales Loft where I could hit record, 
talk out the email, it writes it for you, and then I trim it down. I'm surprised that's not built-in functionality. It's it's the easiest like way to write an email. Um, so with your CTA though, I wanna ask interest-based questions. I wanna basically ask them about their interest in exploring a conversation versus asking them an open-ended question like, is this a challenge? Or uh, what challenges are you running across? Right. Or how are you dealing with this now? Like that's a really hard question to answer through an email. It takes a lot of effort. So I want to reduce friction. It's already a lot of effort to figure out if I want to open your email. It's a lot of effort to read your email and it, it takes effort to reply. I want to reduce the amount of like mental caloric expenditure that a prospect has to put in to figure out what the heck to do with my email. So make it super clear. And then lastly, Lavender's got a lot of great data on this. Your email needs to be 70, 80 words or less. It's about four sentences. It's gotta be super tight. Unless you're writing a very, very good, well-written email, it needs to be four to five sentences or less. That is gold. Um, you empowered us with exactly how to crush cold calling, how to crush cold emails. I see we have a little under five minutes left though, and I want to be respectful yeah. of your time because you got to get to, is it, um, was it, um, judo or jujitsu? I'm sorry. Jujitsu. Yeah. Jujitsu. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, um, I have, uh, two questions and then we'll, we'll sure. call it, um, just how do you think about LinkedIn super high level? Um, I, I'm assuming that it's also a key part of the outbound strategy, yeah. but how does that fit in with the mm -hmm. cold email and, and, and cold calling and any just super high level tips? Yeah. So LinkedIn, you're going to use it very differently than I do. I am a person that creates content all day because I run a business and marketing is a part of what I do. Yeah. You do not need to be an influencer. I hate that word, but you don't need to post content onto LinkedIn to effectively use it. LinkedIn is just another channel, just like phone, just like email. LinkedIn is a place where you're going to send connection requests. You're going to message prospects. You're going to use it for research. I think LinkedIn Sales Navigator is one of the most underrated tools, like underused. You can use it to find past clients or past uh, employees of current clients. You know, you can use it to find people that are newly hired. There's people and filters that you can use to really find like the low hanging fruit gold within your accounts. That's really the primary way that you want to be using LinkedIn. And then also just messaging people. It's just another channel. Yep. And multi-threading is so important to come at a yep. prospect from different angles saying, Hey, yep. you know, I'm, I'm trying to help and I really want to talk to you. And yep. eventually, you know, they'll, they'll get back. So, um, I wanted to wrap up by talking about your vision for the future and what you're building, um, especially heading into 2024, because you're, you're a speaker at sales kickoffs. And I'll tell the audience, if you guys are working at a uh, company in tech sales, why not bring up Jason as a potential speaker? I'm sure, you know, you have coaching and you have many ways to support yeah individuals as well. So what do you, what are the big things you're building? What's your vision for the future? Yeah, the vision is to really be the go-to resource for staff sales. And what's really missing in the marketplace right now is like when you take a typical rep at a company, most of them don't get the training that they need. They get cookie cutter kind of templates and a generic sales process, but they don't get a lot of like the day-to-day -day training around the soft skills and stuff that we've talked about today. So how do we provide that? And then how do we also provide a community of other reps that you can connect with and network with? That's really a big thing. Um, so my vision is that, you know, reps and sales teams have a way to get their hands on the best sales content out there in a really affordable way. And we do that in a couple of ways. One, we have cohorts based programs like Outbound Sprint is something that we're launching right now that you guys could check out. Um, and then we also have B2B sales school. That's, you know, hundred bucks a month to get unlimited access. Wow. To your That's a There's, no brainer. Uh, yeah, I think so. There's live office hours where you can ask people, you can ask me for help on specific deals and review you? emails and things like that. And yeah. And no then That's amazing. the uh, other thing too is working privately with, you know, companies as well as what we do. So training companies, helping to build playbooks, that sort of stuff. But yeah, our goal is to just be the most comprehensive resource out there for, for SaaS salesmen. You are doing an incredible job. This was so packed with value. I'm going to rewatch this and take notes. And thank you to everyone who showed up live here. We got a good audience. And a lot of people are going to see this in the YouTube see as it floats out there. Um, I've linked your website, your LinkedIn cool. for folks to connect and get plugged in with your cohorts, your coaching. I mean, that program at $100 a month and to be able to... Uh, I, 
don't they get access to you? Uh, is, is that where they can get access to you for coaching on deals? Yeah. That, I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. That is yeah. amazing. What an opportunity. Um, and again, guys, if you, you're at a current company, a SaaS company, and you need a sales kickoff speaker, it's right around the corner, sales kickoffs. Uh, you know, Jason's your guy. Uh, bring them up with your um, executive team if you can. Jason, do you have any final like challenge or call to action um, to the um, audience? Yeah, I mean, not to sound too cheesy, but like do something that pushes yourself like outside of your comfort zone. So like in sales, it's pretty easy. You have an opportunity to do that every single day. So pick up the phone and call that executive that you're feeling a little intimidated to call. You know, be persistent with that deal that you just lost. And it's the next quarter when they said that they were going to have budget, you know, um, like do the thing that will scare you a little bit. And before you know it, I mean, your, your comfort zone just grows and grows and grows. And before you know it, you're just habitually doing these really hard things. And that's really where you want to be. So if you're just getting started in sales, like it sucks, dude, it's really hard and it's uncomfortable a lot, but you start to get comfortable with being uncomfortable as they say. There you have it, guys. It's time to get uncomfortable. Thank you for showing up, Jason. Thank you for the time. Crush jujitsu. I know that yeah. if I get in a fight, I want you on my side. And, uh, <laughs> you know, hey, um, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year yeah. to you, to the audience. And guys, to your success in tech sales and in life, happy selling and happy living. And we'll see you in the next one. Cool. Thanks.